So, so we are running. This is John Reed Diginomica live from Constellation Connected Enterprise. And I have an absolute surprise for you. I've got Esteban Kolsky. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having me over. I'm looking forward to this. We haven't spoken in a while. You and I have had some classic enterprise discussions, debates, arguments. We've done video, we've done podcasting, you've had me on your show. And there's a couple of really like important points I want to talk with you about. One is that some of the AI hype conversations have reached a boiling point here at this event. Yeah. Uh, and you're, you moderated a really good panel on sort of like what's next after Gen AI. So I want to get into that a little bit, but you're also kind of a pretty staunch AI critic. And we have, I think, a lot of areas of agreement around that, but it, we still need to talk about it because so many people have bought into this hype that we can't even yeah. have another conversation until we deconstruct that. But I also really want to talk with you about sort of how you're evolving your business model, because all of us, I think, are trying to make a unique, valuable contribution to this market, right? And not mm -hmm. just be critics. Because let's face it, being critics after a while, it kind of eats away at you. It's fun for a point, but yeah, then yeah, you yeah. want to like make a difference, yeah. right? And and that's where I am. I mean, yeah. like, you know, I, I've been doing this business for like 20 plus years. I mean, I, I'd rather not say exactly the number, but you know, it's yeah. closer to 30 than 20. But, and, and the thing is like, you know, I'm getting to the point that like, you know, I'm, I'm looking into the sunset to roll into the sunset. And when you roll into the sunset, you want to leave a legacy. And I don't right. want my legacy to be, oh, that's a grouchy guy that never liked anything. You know? <laughs> right. And so we all so, struggle with that, right? Because yeah. especially... As we get further into our enterprise worlds, we've heard the same crap again and again. And and the emperor doesn't tend to have a lot of new clothes. Yeah. And uh, and it's been kind of it's been interesting because a couple interesting things have happened the last few years that kind of set up this conversation. One is you had me on your show a number yeah. of times where we really got deep into this whole problem with the inter enterprise information ecosystem yeah. and why decision makers can't seem to get the information they trust and that they need amidst all the BS. Like all Which the, is one of the biggest frustrations yes. that I had in my career, right? I mean, right. I, I mean, you talk to as many decision makers and executives as I do, probably if not more, uh, both practitioners and vendors and everybody. And, and the complaints have never changed over the last 10 years, right? right? I mean, there's a whole ecosystem built around creating, generating, and distributing information. And, and, and you know, with very few exceptions, it, it's just crap. I mean, yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to malign anybody, right? I mean, I, I work for a research house. I did work on my own. I, I produced content. Some of my stuff was probably subpar, you know, by by my standards, but it was necessary. But the thing is, like, you know, true decision makers depend on this information now more than ever. And I'm not trying mm -hmm. to be dramatic about it. I'm getting to the point that there's so much information out there. There's so much stuff that finding the right nuggets of of, of value. It, that's what they're looking for. So yeah. how do we actually? create a way to bubble that up and deliver it in a way that generates value for the recipient. That's, right. that's what I think is what we talked about for the last couple of years, and we're trying to yeah. find the answer. Right? And we're all, we're all in individually, and I think collectively, like-minded people like you and me, trying to figure out how to do that, yeah. right? And, 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 of, and I think we have a couple of common criticisms around this, too, in the sense that, that we, we poked some fun, but I think it's serious fun, at the state of the analyst industry, which is not, let's be frank, really delivering on this. And then we have these social no noise environments, right? That yeah. seem to reward self-promotional bombast and, you know, trite statements. And, yeah. and, the, and in the case of AI, like kind of common misperceptions. Yeah. And, and so how do we make our way in that noise environment becomes like a really important question. It does. And, and the, the problem is, like, and you heard me say this before, I call them charlatans of platitudes, right? People that yeah. keep repeating some bites and just some bites. Thinking yeah. that they're providing wisdom to the world, whatever. Yeah. But but the problem AI that, generated sound bites now. Oh yeah. People, exactly. You know, getting the composed, Chat GPT yeah. is a much well, much better charlatan than anybody could. Yeah. Ever, you know. But 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 the, the problem with that is like you know, the people that are making the decisions, the people that grew, because if we go back twenty years, these were not people that grew with computers. They were like you know they were imposed on them, right? Uh, the people making the decisions didn't have the the digital background that, that, that the leaders have today. So then for them, making a decision on technology was a little different than it is today. It's a little different than it will be in 20 years from now. That's just the, the, the nature of the beast. But the people that are, that, that are like, you know, making decisions today, they understand information. They understand information distribution, discerning between good and bad information, relying on the interesting information, and they don't have anywhere to find it. Yeah. And then they go to the established places where they're actually going to get the information, and the information is crap. The yeah. information is biased. The information is like, you know, 
uh, it, it doesn't have any follow up. It, it, it's dated. It, it, there's so many problems. You know what's really interesting too is, I think there's this interesting. I'm trying to find the right word. I think in in AI circles they kind of talk about grounding the model, but I kind of think about that on a human level too because like I've worked really really hard to become grounded in a certain sense, right? And so. The beauty of being grounded and so talking with people like you who will call bullshit on anything mm. that I say that's off, right? <laughs> and and having people like that in my life yeah. and, and, and learning constantly wherever I can is once I become grounded, then I can deal better with imperfect information sources as well, yes. right? Yes. And, I can, and I can extract the value yeah. from that, right? So, Be, so, and so, so I think one of the keys is finding a way for someone like yourself to help someone become grounded so that right. they have the right way to conceptualize all the other things that they take in, right? right? Exactly. And so, so, I mean, put in consumer terms, right? Uh, you want to go to pick a city that I would never go to, doesn't matter what it is, but like, you know, that I've never been to, not that I want to go to, that I've never been to. And I'm going to go there because of whatever reason. I have a wedding, I have a friend that lives there, I'm going to go in business, whatever. And I want to find out, you know, a good hotel, I want to find out a good restaurant, right. I want to find, you know, what to do. So what are my options? I go online and I type, you know, I'm going to visit city X in, yeah, in, in, yeah. in state Y, you know, and then the, the tourism board comes with all the standard things that I, I probably won't get to do because I'm not a very right. good regular tourist. And then you go and like, you, you find Yelp and Yelp is like, you know, bias as, it, as bias as it gets. And you find local versions of Yelp and similar. And then you get TripAdvisor, which has been decaying lately, but TripAdvisor used to be the, 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 the place, you yeah, the the place to go, yeah, right? Yeah. You know that this came from like, you know, people who were there and like the rankings are real and everything. Informed community appears. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You want to find a good restaurant, you go to Itzy, you know? Yeah, you know, Itzy, uh, it, SF or San Francisco, you go to it SF and they have like all the restaurants and they have good reviews. It's just finding that like piece of that person that is reliable. And once you have that, now you have, you know, your baseline and now you can go to Yelp and say like, you know, okay. TripAdvisor said these three restaurants, and Yelp, those three restaurants don't show up. So now that Yelp sucks. But guess what? If they do, now you have a like, you know, baseline that allows you, you to have like, that you know, baseline. Expand. So yeah. that's what we all really need yeah. is that baseline. It doesn't, so, there's never going to be a decision made in one data point. Yeah. But you need to have a grounded, I mean, I, I like the idea of grounding it, grounding the model. Right. You need to have a grounded, a, a, a established, a, a right. accepted uh, you know, starting point that you know that is, is, is you know, the calibration for the rest of the data that you're going to find. So we're building up towards your emergence, but there's a couple other pieces I want to put into place. In, in the videos that you and I did on your show, mm -hmm. um, I, t I talked a little about this. In, does the enterprise have a fake news problem? And I looked at this really carefully because I started to appreciate my enterprise work in contrast to what I view as the consumer part of the world, where I think individuals have a very high tolerance for bad information. Right. And, and the reason they do is they, they don't want something that conflicts with their core beliefs, right? Yeah, but, so, but there's, also, there's also the fact that in the consumer world, the, the price and the effect, uh, the long-term effect of, of a bad choice, you go to a bad restaurant, you pay too much yeah. money, oh, well, you don't go again. You yeah, know, you though I would argue hands. that in some cases, for example, refusing to get a vaccine can be a fatal decision. It but, is. But, 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 but the point world. is that, yeah. but, but, <laughs> but it's an individual paradigm is what yeah, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but the thing I've learned about that is that well, first of all, the karmic system is imperfect, but it does work sometimes in terms of people making such decisions. But the point is that can't be fixed. Like that world, people are always going to take their beliefs over better information for the most part, except okay. for random exceptions. Yeah. In the enterprise, though, if you operate on bad information too yeah. much, your product's going to fail. Your career's going to start capsizing. You're going to spend millions of dollars yeah. and decades in, the, in going the yeah. wrong path. Yeah. And Ray won't invite you to CCE anymore, which is like <laughs> That's terrible. That's going to be a tragedy. Right? Yeah, an absolute tragedy, right? Yeah. So, so this is what fascinates me about the enterprise. It's not like we don't have BS and propaganda in our world. We do. But there's a limit because but, at some point, if you're going to be a long-term success in our line of work, you need better information, which but, is kind of here, here's the thing. Well, it's kind of building up towards your next thing. So, so here's the thing: in the consumer world, ignorance is accepted. Yes, not expected, but accepted. And if it happens, you like you know you can right. shove it off and like oh my yeah. god, he's not going to get a vaccine. I won't deal with him. It's okay. That's his yeah. problem. Never mind. In the enterprise way, ignorance is not acceptable. Right. You know, right. the only reason you have the position that you have and you have the role that you have is because you've proven not to be a person who's driven by you can sink You can sink your team and your project. Yeah. Which, and the beauty of that, getting into my whole media landscape views, 
is that now you and I can compete on relevance, not just entertainment. Absolutely. Yeah. And competing on relevance is more fun to me than, no, it than, is. than trying to be entertaining all the time. Because I can't be an influencer. That time came and went. <laughs> TikTok passed me by. I'm screwed. I but we I, can I, do I never this. like being called an influencer, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah never, exactly. Yeah. Right. So screw that, right? Yeah. So okay, so that's one piece of the puzzle. But the other piece of the puzzle is that I noticed for a while, and you're you you've been a strong AI critic, and we're going to get into that. But some of your posts on LinkedIn around that topic and a few others started to feel like they had like a real strong edge. And to the point where I remember calling you and saying, dude, are you all right? Because yeah. yes. you were coming strong and, you, and it wasn't like you were wrong, but I was kind of like, I felt like maybe something was starting to get out of balance between the things you didn't like and yeah. like finding like something positive yes. in this world. And so it was super interesting because then you kind of went dark for a while. I yes. stopped seeing you. So, and now you're back. So, but with a new idea. So like, can you talk a little bit about what you went through there in terms of like- There, there was a, a lot of frustration that contributed mm -hmm. to that. And the frustration came from several places, but like, you know, having done a stint as, a, as an executive in a large, you know, vendor, uh, provided a lot of the stuff that I didn't have before. Look, mm -hmm. I spent years as an analyst from the outside looking in, right? And knowing what happens when you provide input into a vendor process and then nothing happens in that frustration. Yeah. So I said, if I go in, I can probably fix that. And I went in and I learned the other side of it. And, and I got to tell you, man, it's not bad. It's yeah. just different. And the level of frustration and politics and things like that left me in a pretty odd space when I left the vendor world. Mm -hmm. right? and, and I took some time off. And, and for some serendipity, you know, happenstance, whatever you want to call it, AI started emerging right after I left to win the vendor world. And it started being like, you know, everybody's going into the hype of AI. And I'm going like... Was it like salt in the wound in a way? Like, yeah. yeah. Well, part, partly that and partly the fact like, I've been doing this stuff for like 40 years. I've been in you know, AI since 1984 is when I started in AI. You know, symbolic systems yeah. and linguistics, right? And, and I've been doing this stuff and like, you're going to tell me that now everybody's discovering this thing and like it's so magnificent when it still doesn't deliver any value for what it was in the past. And this is where like the darkness that you call an AI came from. I'm like, you know, look, I'm tired of dealing with people that are like, you know, it's just fucking ignorant to put, you know, I'm not supposed to curse, so freaking ignorant. You know, I'm trying to, yeah, to, to yeah. deal with people that are ignorant in the enterprise. And I'm tired to deal with people that rely on hype to overcome that ignorance. And, yeah. and then this is becoming like, you know, way too deep, right? And it, it was, it was, you know, I was recovering from, from a bad, for a bad place where I was. It was like a, you know, one of those like, you know, the perfect storm, like people say, yeah. the market started going into the wrong direction. Uh, there was no, no discerning between like good and bad information. Like you're saying, there was nobody that was providing it wasn't, information. And it wasn't, beginning. and it wasn't like you were wrong in your assertions. I mean, I think a no, lot of, a lot no, of what came pretty dark. I know that. Yeah. A lot of what you're re you were reacting to is sort of like knowing the history of AI and knowing that really generative AI is just a popularization of it's a, a prob trick. A, it's, a it's probabilistic a technology yeah. that's been around for a long time. Yeah. So, so, so you weren't wrong, but it was something about the tone where I was kind of like, yeah, I felt a little bit like you were looking for something else, but also which is kind of what you went through, right? Yeah, you it, said, it is exactly what I went through. But also keep in mind that like, you know, society changed dramatically in the last five years, right? I right. mean, before I went into SAP and I was still an analyst and I would take a tone like the one I did and people would like, not celebrate it, but accept it. And in the last five years, since the pandemic and like the mm. evolution post-pandemic, we're in a different place where people don't have the patience and the ability to deal with that stuff. So I had to actually recalibrate my tone and my approach to it and say, like you said, I'm not wrong in what I'm saying. I'm just wrong in how I'm saying it. Mm. And there's got to be a better way that is value-based versus like, you know, conflict-based that would actually allow me to be heard in a better way. And right. this is the part that he said that I went dark. So I went in and I said, I'm tired of doing this. I, th I'm not seeing any value from this, so I'm right. going to go find a problem that I can solve and find a solution to that problem instead of saying, like, you know, listen to me, I'm here standing on top of the rock and I know everything. It's like, okay, right. what, what, are, what are the problems that we're seeing that we can solve that right. would have true value for the enterprise, true value for my customers and the vendor? And I think the, the best thing about the enterprise and why I still have hope for folks like you and I in the enterprise is that we don't have to revolutionize the enterprise. We just have to find something we believe in that enough resonates with enough people yep. for us to be successful, right? Yep. And so then you put out in the last week or so uh, a major kind of LinkedIn post update. Yep. You yourself and Alan Berkson, 
Yes. My and so, Alan and I, we, we, so we, tell us about this emergence and what you're planning to so, do. So, you know, Alan, Alan is, is a really good friend that we've been talking forever yep. about this. And we've been talking and about how- about as smart as guys you can run into, so. Well, there's better people, but not many. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Alan. No, no, no. But no, but, but seriously, it's like, you know, I, I love Alan to death and he's been putting up with my, 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 my complaints and everything forever. And he's the one when I said, I need to, he's the one who said, you're going into a dark place. You need to turn this into a solution or else like, you know, get off the soapbox because people are going to get tired. Nobody likes somebody constantly whining about the scene without doing anything, right? Right. And I said, okay. So then this coincided with some conversations I had with some friends that work for different vendors and like, you know, their, their challenges and the problems they were having. And then correlating all that with my, my career and saying, look, there's a problem here. You know, authentic stories don't come through. Right. I mean, this is a problem for vendors, it's a problem for prospects, it's a problem for customers, yep. it's a problem for everybody. You know, forget the function, sales, uh, customer success, you know, marketing, everybody has the same problem. When the authentic stories don't come through, you end up with like, you know, it's just fluff and fluff doesn't do anything. There's no value in it. It's shocking because I know, I obviously know a lot about this line of work because I've done hundreds of intake interviews around customer stories, but I've also work with a lot of vendors around this and it's shocking to me how many vendor produced customer case studies don't include a single project challenge, yep. a single obstacle, a single issue of change or change management, like nothing. They also don't include was, th things like timeline to deploy yeah. and results. And right. Account. Results, quanti yeah. quantifying they, they put stuff. Metrics, yeah. but the metrics are fluff metrics that are like aligned with yeah. what the, the vendor's promising. Yeah, but the pro it's, it's like, it's got a, sometimes it does have that good problem statement, but it's basically like, they were toiling, in, uh, you know, in legacy hell, and then they found the magic techno solution for us. And in us. two weeks, we went from yes. nothing to the completely yeah. deployed. And, and, the, and the ocean parted, and they yeah. walked through in their in their sandals, and everything was beautiful. And you and I sit in the background going like, wait, yeah. another company in that project. That took like six <laughs> years, and they're still not deployed. So anyway, so you... But, but so this is, yeah. this is the thing. The, the, the key to all this is like, you know, I was talking to a few fr friends that work with vendors and they were saying, my prospects, my customers need information that I cannot provide for them. Mm -hmm. I cannot find the information. I don't know how to extract the information. And the people that are actually dealing with the customer, the salespeople, the marketing people, the go-to-market people, the product marketing people, they don't know how to ask the right question, right? And I was saying, well, wait a minute, I've been doing this for like 20 years. This is what I specialize in. I mean, when I got a, a reference or a case study from a vendor, I went deep. I went into like, you know, I didn't go into product selection. I got into like, you know, product selection and like, you know, uh, adoption and uh, implementation and, and operations. And like, you know, mm -hmm. I, I find the good and the bad and the, the metrics and the stuff that, I mean, this is what I've been doing my whole life, trying to get the information that really matters. So you cannot create a magic water if you're a gardener or a wave if you're a forester based on the, the, the marketing fluff that you get as case studies from the vendor. And when you talk to the, the customer, the customer has been cautioned to like, you know, only talk about what's in the case study. But guess what? Do you know how many customers said to me, I would never tell this to the vendor, but since you're asking, right. and then they give me information that is like, you know, crucial to understand the whole thing. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and they said, is there a way to create or put all that into methodology so I can offer this, not to bring a vendor down, which would be like an evaluation, you know, to say, oh, your customer said this about you and it's bad and we're going to bring your score down. But like, you know, is there a way I can create a methodology, create a, a model, create a, a service? for my, my friends who are working at vendors so they can actually capture all this information and then decide what they want to do with it. Do they want to use it in case studies? Do they want to use it internally? Do they want to use it with the customer? Well, how do they want to mm -hmm. use it? But you got to capture the right information and like structure the information in a way that is in a database and it's accessible, that it's findable, you know, and all this stuff. And we're not doing this because, you know, we're asking stupid questions like, you know, oh, why did you think we were great? And how, long, how short time did it take you to, to adopt us? And like, you know, it's been great, right? Right? You know, and then the answer to those questions always going to be positive, but that doesn't depict really the value of the case study. So then I went back and I said, okay, let me go look, you know, at, at, at all the case studies that I collected over the years. And, and that's where I started this whole process. Mm -hmm. You know, look at everything that exists, look at what has been done, then go find research and information on like what people are looking for, then correlate what I, I collected in market research service over right. the years and come up with a model that says like, look, here's the deal. Your, your prospects, your customers, they want information that is authentic, yep. that is current, and it relates to companies like them, right? If I, if I work in retail and you give me a case study of someone in transportation, it doesn't do much for me. Right. Sure, I can say that, you know, if you tell me that they chose you because, like, you know, you, you were the, 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 the second coming of, of the Messiah, it doesn't do much for me. Right. If you tell me, like, they grew 20% yes. 
you know, over, 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 like you know, expectations. But you don't tell me what the expectations were. You don't tell me why they got to this expectation. It doesn't do anything mm-hmm. to me. So, so then you know, I went through all this stuff and I came up with a bunch of stats that actually proved the point that, like you know, case studies today, information collected mm-hmm. today sucks, and customers want better. Right. And there's a way to 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 bridge that to, to bridge that gap. I like the thinking there because I mm-hmm. think vendors a lot of times internally lose track of how relatively sophisticated a lot of their prospects and customers are and how auto- yeah. and how autonomously they yeah. operate in this world and they can really see through a lot of the the sort of promo gloss and they really they have such a hunger to understand what their peers are going through yeah. and and I think it goes back to earlier in our conversation around these kind of peer review sites in our consumer lives yeah. we're so used to this unvarnished feedback right and 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 we have a, such a hard time getting that that's when we're trying to make enterprise decisions mm-hmm. that we can get unvarnished but that combination of unvarnished and deeply informed together is really tough to find that and the fact that like you know review sites ended up getting gained because that's that's what works yeah. better for everybody i mean it worked better for the provider of the review sites because now they can sell information that they collected to the vendor and the vendor has a has a you know, a, a, a CYA approach to this. Right. Like they want to, they, all the clients who said they're great and they're like, they, they push people with the right stories to tell, to, to tell the, the right stories in those sites. And it becomes another repository of like, you know, hurrah, we are awesome information. Right. And, and yes. what, what, what prospects and customers want, like you said, sophisticated prospects, sophisticated customers, what they're looking for is unvarnished information about how to yes. get it right. The words are much more attractive than, than, than the polish in this case. Yes, you know? exactly. And, and, so then, then I went back and I looked at all this stuff and I said, okay, I've been doing this stuff for like, you know, quite a few years. I know what I'm talking about. I can probably put a methodology together and then I can go and sell this methodology. And I'm not selling the methodology to capture the data. Right. That's the tip of the, the, the spear, right? right? That's where we start. But I'm selling the methodology. They're like, I'm doing this, plus I'm doing analyst analysis, you know, analyst, trained analysts from like traditional research house analysis on each case study and collecting the information and aggregating the information. I'm indexing the information so you can find it and creating quantitative and qualitative information that you can use. And I'm actually working with you on the findings of the information to share actionable insights with each relevant stakeholder and help them implement those actionable insights. That's yeah. the model of the agency. It's like, it's not just telling better stories. It's not just right. making it glitzier. It's just finding right. the true story and then, and then working with my vendor partners and realizing what information do you want to release to whom. Here's the, the whole unvarnished truth about your product, as your customers mm-hmm. said, right? This is what your customers told me. Right. And look, man, I, I'm, I'm, there's parts that I cannot share because they asked me for confidence and I'm going to remain that, but this right. is like, you know, a, a good aggregate of your problems. How much you want to share of that? That's, that's the decision that like, you know, we, we, we get to at the end. Yeah, exactly. It, true confession time. I have to go back quickly to my childhood. One, uh, <laughs> one moment of disillusion in my childhood was when Cat Stevens converted to Islam. Because I followed like the, his music at a time when I was kind of spiritually searching in my life, yeah. And I really did not need to read like that. My one of my role models for spiritual search had found the one <laughs> answer. And when you made your LinkedIn post, I wondered if you'd pulled an AI Cat Stevens on me because <laughs> because I thought maybe no. you had developed some AI driven methodology to do no. this so you scared the crap out of so, me I was like oh no but, but you know what it's funny you mentioned that because a few of the people that I'm talking to they said they said to me oh we're trying to do that with AI yeah. we're, we're feeding AI all our case studies over the years and have them find like you know the, the relevant information that we can use and then going like oh my god that is so stupid I said look I have the data here let me let me get it because it's actually really interesting I went through 243 case studies that I have in my, in my records, right, for the last 20 years of doing this. The average age of a case study is four years old. Right. Okay. One out of eight of them, or like 12.5% if you want to do that, but I prefer one out of eight, is not dated. Mm. 21 out of 22, which means basically 0.5%, didn't have a date or any information that was relevant to when that inf- mm. decision was made. They all, all the focus on all these case studies that I read, was on internal needs. It was like, you know, right. hey, we're actually going to market with this message. Can we find people that will repeat the message for us? It, it was like, you know, alignment with the narrative. So where blah, you're, blah, blah. so part of where you're headed there is if you plug that into an AI system, that'd be a disaster. Garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, you can tell me that, oh no, we create an NLM exclusive to the content of our case studies. That's great, but you're putting mm-hmm. crap in there. What are you going to come out? It's like, you know, this. You, you listen to these stats and you go, that's horrible. None of that is relevant to me, mm-hmm. you know? 
uh, especially as, a, as an end user looking for, for information to make, like you said, the right information to make the right decisions. How do I make a decision on, on a four-year-old uh, you know, case study that's never been updated and that it relies on marketing fluff to tell a story that doesn't align with what I need? I mean, the counterside to that, you know, IDG did a, did a study through the Foundry, which is one of their like, you know, online uh, uh, brands, and basically said, you know, three out of four customers want current stories from companies like me. Three out of five executives say that these, these stories create a trusted relationship, and this is the one that killed me. Four out of five executives say that they need these stories to help shorten decision-making, support budget and demands, mm. and act quickly. Right. This is, this but, is what vendors want. But if, they, if those stories appear like in that sort of airbrushed version, right. and I think it falls apart. It's not, it's not authentic. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't do it. And Be, because the person yeah. who's reading knows that that's not the way it is. Right. There was no like, you know, epiphany when I was one time coming back from a trip and I said, oh my God, you know, vendor X can solve all my problems. I'm going to call them tomorrow and be implemented by next week and solve all my problems that way. No decision making yeah. will ever agree with that. But that's yeah. the way that these fluffy stories make You know what blows like. me blows me away is how little vendors take opportunity to do the kind of thing you're describing. And I'll give you a couple of quick examples. One of my favorite things to see in a in a enterprise keynote, and I hardly ever see it, is not just bringing a customer up on stage, but I love when the vendor hands the mic to the customer and they go and gets the hell off yeah. the stage yeah and just lets the customer run the show yeah and say whatever they need to say yeah. for the next 10 or not not five minutes but let's go 10 or 15 into this thing yeah and let's really hear your story but you know that most, I, most of those what a stories, show of confidence most right? of those stories happen when they're in analyst sessions they don't happen to the general public they don't yeah. But but so it's we a, get better exposure to that, and we we know that there's a better story to be told. Yeah, but it's a huge show of confidence. Yeah. Oh, one thing that I saw once at a Domo show that I've never seen repeated was a customer panel on stage run by a customer. Yeah. So the customer was the moderator. Yeah. Of the customer panel, the yeah. vendor was nowhere to you be seen. You know who does a really good job of that is SaaS. Love that. They actually have a customer conference run by the customers, where yeah. SaaS simply provides the budget and gets out of the way, and they do whatever they want. There to you do. go. And they they do basically. They, they, they network all the people that have the product to, to tell, tell the stories. And yeah, some right. of them are like, you know, fluffed a little bit because people want to like, you sure. know, tell a better story of who they are. But for the most part, the amount of information that you can capture in, the, in, those, right. in, those, in those moments is crucial. And yeah. I have access to those moments by virtue of them giving me access to that person that right. I can not only interview, but actually have a conversation. You know, yeah. I ask quantitative and qualitative information uh, 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 yeah. questions, collect all this. And then at the end, I look at everything and say, okay, I need more information on this. And I go back and get deeper and deeper into that until I get all the information that I need. And I think that would be really powerful for vendors because, you know, the other thing that I run into a lot at shows where, where someone like yourself in this role could really help is a lot of times they don't even know what their best stories are. So I'll interview right. a handful of customers and, I'll, and a lot of times I'll go back to the vendor and say, you know what, this, this wasn't such a great story and here's why. Or this was a fantastic story because... A lot of times they're like, oh, this is a blue chip brand, but I'm like, yeah, but they're, they're early adopters on your product or they really haven't achieved any ROI on anything yet. I don't care if it's a famous name or not. It's not a yeah. great friggin' story. And then other times I'll have a talk with a customer that is not as well known and I'll be like, do you realize what a great story this is? And like, well, they're not using our AI technology. I'm like, I don't care. If they're not using any this, of the, say this, like, like they're right doing amazing stuff. And this is the critical part yeah. because if it doesn't align with my marketing needs and uh, marketing, marketing, yeah. uh, you know, uh, needs right now, yeah. then I won't use the story. And it's a extremely, extremely powerful story that is being wasted exactly. because it doesn't deliver what the, the, the keywords or the more, the comments that I actually need from that. And that's yeah. the part that I want to resolve because, you know, I want to at least capture that. Doesn't mean that the vendor is going to use it or let me use it. But guess what? Once you have it, right. you can massage it a little bit and use it. That's much more powerful than a story about like, you know, how I was flying back from Nepal in my yeah. spiritual search and I found this article about how Vendor X can solve this. And I said, oh my God, serendipity, they will help me. And I called them in the morning when I landed and they were there the next day right. and they did a demo that blew me away and I adopted the product and oh God, lo and behold, it's working better than ever. That's so not what, a story that anybody will share. Exactly. You know? So what you're gonna let me see if I got this right then. So essentially if 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 I'm a vendor and I bring you and Alan in, what you're gonna do is you're gonna talk to a number of my customers in depth yes. off the record, fifteen or twenty, say, yes. 
Collect and, the information. And, I'm going to capture the critical information. Through, through a proprietary methodology that you've developed. Yeah. And the end result of that is going to be a customer intelligence uh, database of sorts yeah. with qualitative data that they can Quantitative then... Quantitative and qualitative. Right. That they can then evaluate and then from there consult with you and their internal people as well to figure out what different forms that exactly. can take. Absolutely. Public, private, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Peers. And, and we'll create discuss, the content yeah. from there. But you can't create content without data. Yeah. You know, this is what AIs all over the world are realizing. Yeah, the yeah, content yeah. matters, right? So, but once we have the content, then we'll figure out what's the best way to use it. But you got to capture the content, man. And you got to capture right. the right way, not just capture only what, like, what is going to help you do your job, but like the stuff that, like, you don't want to talk about, the words. You got to capture the word because that's what people are looking for. Well, I, I, I wish you, you two all the best on this. I'll look forward to tracking it. But I think one of the things I'm, most excited about, regardless of exactly how this all pans out, is it's great to see you with an appetite for something new that you're excited about because I think you're a really important voice in this industry, but I think you you needed something like this so that you can balance like the things you're deconstructing with like yeah. and so what are you doing about it, Esteban? Well, here's exactly what I'm doing yeah. about it. And I'm, I'm not know? demeaning AI. We can have that conversation some other time, but I'm actually finding, look, I found a, a, a great friend who has an ex incredible talent at storytelling that goes beyond mine, right? And this is Alan. And Alan will bring a lot of value on that aspect. And, and by, the way, folks, if, by the way, folks, if you don't know Alan's work, do some search on corporate narratives and his Absolutely. name and some cool stuff will yep. come up. But Alan's one of the best in terms of how to take these individual stories yeah. and frame it in an overall yeah. company narrative. Anyway, so. I, I'll bring my analyst, my analyst experience, he's bring his corporate narrative experience, and we go to, we go to work with vendors where we create this database cool. of information and help them create a better narrative, a better story, whatever you need. And then, then we'll, we'll keep it running forever. I mean, the idea is not to do it once and just forget mm -hmm. about it. It's continuously, longitudinal, year after year after year. Update the case studies. Talk to the same people to see that they're still working. At some point, it becomes, you know, decreasing returns, right? That's fine. But you replace them or you bring new people. But you have to actually keep it up. The fact that, like, you know, the, the, one, out of tw 20, one out of 22 get followed up, that just blows my mind. If you find somebody who got a success, why won't you follow up? You, you have somebody's captive audience on, on success with your product. Follow up. Capture more data. Capture more information. Provide that, you know, to, to the other people. Say, hey, right. I know that you made a decision based based on like Acme Industries. Guess what they did last year that actually expanded, extended the, the thing. Are you interested in something like this? You know? Anyways, there, there's, there's a lot we can talk about, but the, the, the bottom line is like, you know, it's a methodology that resolves the issue of capturing the best, your best customer stories and using that in many different ways to create value for you and your car. Right. So. Uh, we're not going to have a full AI conversation today, but just going to take a quick pause here.